Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to God's house today. Glad you joined us for, for worship. And this is a time where we get to come together and celebrate what the Lord has done. And so I just invite you this morning, let's put, let's put everything that we have into worship today. God is worthy of our praise. We'll just stand and let's sing to our King. Sing to the King who is coming to reign. Glory to Jesus, the Lamb that was slain. Sing to the King, for His returning, we watch and we pray, we will be ready the dawn of that day, we'll join in singing with all the redeemed, to say is vanquished and Jesus is King. So come, let us sing a song, a song declaring we belong to Jesus. He is all we need. Lift up a heart of praise. Sing Sing that second verse one more time. For his returning, we watch and we pray. We will be ready the dawn of that day. We'll join in singing with all the redeemed. Cause Satan is back. to some folks around you, and then you may be seated. Be the name of the Lord. 
Yeah. 
the last couple of weeks, I've been revisiting the book of Psalms in, in preparation for a new Bible study that starts this Wednesday. And although there are many theme, themes that emerge in the Psalms, one that especially stands out is praise. The psalmist show us the, the necessity of praise in our lives. By praising God in the good times, we affirm that he alone is the one from whom all blessings flow. By praising God in the bad times, we affirm that God is good and faithful, and we place our trust completely in him. And by praising God in our doubts and confusion, we reorient ourselves towards God instead of on self and circumstances. And here are some other reminders about praise that I think we all need from time to time. First of all, who should praise? Psalm 150 verse 6 says this, Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Look to your left and right. Do you see anybody that has breath this morning? Sometimes it's hard to tell, isn't it? Maybe you need to pinch them first. But I think we all have breath. That means we're all qualified to praise God. That means you and me and all of creation, everything that has breath should praise the Lord. When should we praise? Psalm 34 says, I will praise the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be on my lips. You know, praise is not something we just do once a week. It's a lifestyle. It's always time to praise the Lord. Why should we praise? You know, if I listed all the reasons why we should praise, we would be here literally for eternity. The main reason that we praise is that God is worthy of our praise. We should praise him for who he is and what he has done and what he's going to do. God is good and he deserves our praise. Praise also unleashes the power of God and drives Satan away. Paul and Silas were in prison praising God in the middle of the night when God sent an earthquake and started a revival in the jail cells. And if we want to see God do that more and more, we need to praise him more and more. How should we praise? You know, that's a difficult question because our, our praise can take a variety of, of shapes and sizes. It can be quiet and solitary, or it can be loud and exuberant. Praise is often mentioned as a collective thing that we do together. There's something about coming together in the name of Jesus and praising that name. We can sing, we can shout, we can dance, we can lift our hands, we can play musical instruments. All of that is good and proper as long as it focuses attention on God and not on us. Psalm 84 begins with these words. It says, with my whole being, body, and soul, I will shout joyfully to the living God. And it ends up with this. It says, what joy for those who trust in you. Psalm 71, 14 says, as for me, I will always have hope. I will praise you more and more. Now, praise is something that we are going to do for all of eternity. It's not optional. And it brings joy and hope. So why wouldn't we want to praise? It draws us into the presence and power of God. So if you're not convinced that we need to praise, maybe we need to, to praise a little more so that, that God's spirit will be here and uh, just wake us up and shake us up and let us be in a mindset where he is number one in our lives once again. Would you stand and, and let's just sing this last song that uh, just talks about praising the name of, of the Lord our God. And so let's just uh, warm up and get ready for eternity when all of creation will praise that wonderful and glorious name. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in joy.
in some type of praise, whether it's amen, hallelujah, thank the Lord. He's a good God. He's a good God. Lord, we thank you for being such an amazing Savior to us. While we were still sinners, while we were a mess, undone, a train wreck, God, you sent your only Son to die for us. Lord, because of that, we praise you this morning. We praise you for your mercy. We praise you for your grace. We praise you for the favors, the blessings. We praise you just for the hope that we have. Lord, at the end of the day, Lord, there's hope. At the beginning of the day, there's hope. Lord, there's always hope because we know that Jesus is in tomorrow. And God, regardless of what happens today, we know that Jesus is with us. He will never leave us nor forsake us. God, we thank you for the spirit of praise that we have here today. We thank you for these people that have gathered on your day to lift up your name, your house. God, your people, Lord, what an amazing feeling to be part of the family of God. Lord, the forever family. Lord, we know that uh, our biological family, uh, Lord, those, those members, as they pass away, it seems like, uh, God, uh, way too often we're saying goodbye to them. But Lord, we know that for the family of God, it's a forever family because once we say see you later at the grave, God, uh, we know that there is a tomorrow. We know that we will never die. We know that we will live forever. And God, we just praise you for uh, the the blessings that you give us. We praise you. God, uh, in this spirit of praise, we are cognizant of of some needs. We're cognizant of needs in our, our own community. Lord, those who are hurting, those who have lost loved ones in our own church. Father, there are those who are still hurting from saying goodbye. And we pray that you would give comfort to them. God, uh, we know that in our own church and community, there are those that have what the doctors call a terminal illness, that it will not uh, end well. And Father, for those who are going through that, that just know it's a matter of time, we pray that you would give that peace and that comfort. God, we, we pray for those who are just struggling financially right now. And Lord, as gas just keeps going up and up and the prices of food uh, keep going up and up and everything else lord just follows suit and lord uh, sometimes it's tough to make a living and father for those of us who are so blessed sometimes we lord whenever we see the price of gas 
go up, we say, oh man, but Lord, for others, they know that uh, that makes it even more difficult for them to just exist. And God, I pray that you would help us to be cognizant of those in our community that even though their lifestyles may contribute, Father, let us show love and grace and mercy because that's what you showed us. Lord, I want to pray that you would just be with, uh, with our world. God, the war that is still taking lives. Lord, we pray for your people that are suffering. We pray for your people that are still praying for peace. And Lord, in Ukraine, and God, uh, just the uncertainty there. Will their country survive? Will their culture survive? Will their family survive? God, we pray that you would bring peace. And then, Lord, we also pray for the peace of Jerusalem. That's what you instruct us to do in your word. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And God, for those that have traveled to uh, Jerusalem, and Lord, just so many different religions that have uh, kind of put down their flag, and they've said, this is our place. This is our special place. And God, uh, there's not peace there in Jerusalem. And so, Lord, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Lord, we pray for our own country, just as we are in a transition, it appears, that uh, seems like, uh, Lord, some, some people can hardly wait to get away from the Judeo-Christian values, and uh, God, they, they champion those things that um, you don't champion, and Father, uh, they feel like that's progress whenever you call it sin. Lord, I pray that you would not let us be just bystanders. But God, help us to be people on the field fighting for uh, principles and for those things, Lord, that you hold dear. And God, I pray that you would give us wisdom when to speak up and maybe when to just hit our knees in prayer and pray. And so, Lord, give us that wisdom. And Lord, for our for our small groups that begin this week, I pray that you would be with all of our teachers and Lord, uh, for our, our kids and our youth programs, I pray that as we transition into the summer uh, events, the summer programs, Lord, that you would just uh, really uh, make this a special time of ministry for this service today. Lord, for the kids that will be in a separate part of the building as they learn about you and not just about you, but they would learn the character of God, the majesty of God. Would you be, Lord, with them? And then, Lord, here in this room, be with Rachel. Lord, I prayed for her earlier as she sings for us. I just ask that you would enable her and anoint her. And I thank you for this young lady that you've given so many talents and uh, God just uses them for you. And Lord, as we open your word in a few moments, I pray that it would be something that would meet our needs. Lord, maybe convict us where we've gone astray. Maybe encourage us where we've become discouraged. Lord, let this be a day filled with God's presence, God's power. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning. Thank you for being with us today and for worshiping with us. Um, we welcome those of you watching online as well. And if you're with us online, would you drop a comment in the comment section to let us know that you're with us today? Um, this evening at 5, there's a meeting in room A4, which is right across the hall over here, about the missions trip to Ecuador. And if you're planning to go, but uh, if you're planning to go but can't attend that meeting, please let one of the staff know. We're trying to finalize plans, be buying tickets soon, things like that. So uh, please be there or talk to Pastor Joe or me if, if you can't be there. Uh, this coming Wednesday, we begin the summer session of life groups, um, kids summer blasts, the youth group summer Wednesday nights. And in your bulletin, you'll find the lineup for the summer life groups. And make sure you sign up for those groups at the table in the foyer so we have an idea of the numbers and we know which rooms to put those classes in. And Wednesday evenings, we're not feeding the kids beforehand or running the buses, uh, but we do have classes. The kids' classes are called Summer Blast, and uh, youth is Summer Wednesday nights. And so that begins this Wednesday at 7 
uh, here in the building. Youth group will start in the Family Life Center through the summer. Uh, we have devotional books in for this quarter out in the foyer. And this is the last week to submit recipes for the church cookbook. So if you've been meaning to submit a recipe or uh, if you've been trying to figure that out, get it together, get it in before next Sunday, and uh, we're going to get this church cookbook made. If this is the first you've heard of that, um, you can. there's some information in the foyer. Talk to one of us. Uh, find Debbie Hubbard. She's got all the details on that. Uh, but, but submit your best stuff. Um, if you've got a recipe that your family really likes, then turn it in. Um, and as we've said, like, don't just turn in like one of the Food Network recipes printed off the website. But even if you've taken one of their recipes and made it your own and your family loves it, it's fine to submit something that you've worked on a little bit. So we want to make this a great church cookbook that uh, somebody could pick up and just be able to make a lot of really great meals out of. All right, Rachel's going to come and sing, and uh, then we, we will look at the study of God's Word together with Pastor Joe. So some of you may have um, grown up hearing or singing this hymn, um, but you may not know some of the background behind the hymn. Um, this hymn was written by um, an Irish pastor and poet named Joseph Scriven. And um, in kind of looking into this song a little bit more, he um, actually experienced a fair amount of um, tragedy in his life. Um, his first fiance was killed the night before they were to be married in a freak accident. And, and then after he moved to Canada um, to become a pastor, later became um, engaged to a young woman who died a few weeks before they were to be married again, um, this time from pneumonia. And so um, through his kind of grief and sorrow, he kind of turned that into um, ministry, um, serving the poor, preaching, tutoring, all kinds of things, and writing hymns. And um, this hymn, he actually never intended to be a hymn. It was a poem that he had written back to his mother in Ireland and um, who was ill. And it was a, supposed to be kind of a, just an encouragement to her while she was ill. It was called Pray Without Ceasing and was a, just an encouragement to all of us that um, no matter what we might be facing, um, we still have a friend in Jesus. Oh, what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we Take 
Rachel. By the way, how many of you have never heard that hymn before? Anybody? You, you have heard it. Okay. That's just one of those classics that we don't sing too much. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. As announced last week, we are wrapping up our Sunday morning series entitled, After We Fall Asleep, which is a way that the Bible many times refers to death and dying, 40 times, refers to death and dying as falling asleep. So, this has been a series about what happens after we take our last breath. Now, we've covered a lot of ground. We've talked about the judgment. We've talked about heaven. We've talked about hell. Um, and it's interesting. I was talking with uh, someone that just recently has started coming to this church, and they said, you know, we, we've attended other, uh, other churches, and uh, they said, we have not heard a message on hell in the last seven years. And... Um, but it is a real place. Uh, we've talked about the rewards that Christians will receive at the judgment seat of Christ. We've talked about the cosmic conflict where, where Lucifer, who was the guardian cherub of the angels, rose up against God and tried to take him down, but of course lost the battle, was thrown out of heaven along with a third of the angels. And Lucifer, which today more commonly we know him as Satan or the devil, he's trying to get revenge on God by taking down his children. I mean, if someone really wants to hurt you, what's one of the best strategies? Go after your kids. If someone hurts your kids, that's more painful than them hurting you. And so Satan is trying to hurt God by going after his children. Now this morning as we wrap up this series, um, in a totally different style lesson than we typically give on a Sunday morning, we're going to deal with some questions regarding the afterlife that you, on occasion, ask me. Seven is the perfect number, and so we're going to try to strike perfection this morning by asking and trying to answer seven questions. And here are the ground rules for our study this morning, as well as every lesson that I give. Whenever the Bible speaks clearly towards a subject, I will try to give an answer based on the Word. Um, however, realizing that there are some subjects in which the Bible doesn't necessarily address specifically, in those situations, I will try to look at 
surrounding biblical principles that apply. But then there are also what I call opinion questions, opinion answers. And, and, and these are questions where we may not be able to find clear answers in the Bible. And so for those questions, then I will say, I'm not sure, but here is what I think. And at every step of the way, you have the right to disagree with me because you always had the right to be wrong. Is that fair enough? <laughs> Let's dive in and get this first question out of the way. And, and really this question that seems to be rather lighthearted is, is way more controversial than you would think. I've, I've done messages on all sorts of heavy and intense subjects, but it seems that people on this topic allow their emotions to get wrapped up and, um, and even though they may not have the backing of, of Scripture, yet they just about lose their salvation defending their position on this question. So let's begin asking this question by asking this question that will rankle some of you, my dear friends. Do our pets go to heaven? Now, I realize for a Sunday morning study, this question sounds superficial, and, and if you're looking for a reason, or those of you that are watching online, listening on radio, if, if you're looking for a reason to criticize me or this church, this question probably will give you that reason, and you can say, that's the church of God holding us for you. I told you about them. Y you know, they never get into the Word. Pastor Joe never gets into the Word, just talks about fluff, nonsense. Of course, if you would have been here the entire series, you probably would not say that knowing that we've dealt with deep subjects like hell and the judgment. But anyways, I've listened to you talk down through the years. This question is on some of your minds. So, do our pets go to heaven? Well, I want to tell you that absolutely, unquestionably, the answer is, it depends. <laughs> what kind of pet are we talking about? Just, just kidding. You expected me to say something about felines, didn't you? And my wife and my grandson gave orders, don't you dare talk about cats today. And so we're not going to in a negative way. But when it comes to our pets, I understand what it's like to get attached to pets. This past week, I was thinking of the different pets my family has had. You know, we've had dogs and And this is really hard for me to admit publicly because it probably puts me over into the category of a hypocrite. But our family has had cats. We, we had a cat that we called Tom. I know that's really creative, Tom Trussell. Um, and, and I'm sorry if admitting that causes you to lose confidence in me. We've had dogs, we've had cats, we've had birds, we've had rabbits, we've had ducks, we've had lizards, we've had snakes, we've had rhinoceros beetles, we had a fox, a gray fox, we had an ocelot which is like a bobcat with a long tail. We had a squirrel for a short time. We actually had a jaguar, not the car, but the cat. We've had hermit crabs, mice, hamsters, turtles, fish, eels, bearded dragons. So I understand what it's like to have pets. And I even understand the pain and having to say goodbye to our pets. I, I, I've gotten pretty emotional, emotionally attached to some of our pets. Herman was a basset beagle hound that I had when I was in high school. He was my buddy. We went hunting together. He was my soul brother. Uh, you know, a basset beagle does a lot of howling, and, and that was our language between us, and we understood each other, but one day Herman got run over. I took it hard. He was my buddy. Tassie was another one of our special pets. She was a Pomeranian that we had for 14 years. We trained her to shake, speak, stay, count to three. She really would, and spin around, stand up on her back legs. And when I would walk in the house in the evening, I would ask her, Tassie, how was your day? And she would answer, rough. <laughs> I'm serious. She always had rough days, never had a good day. It was always a rough day, like, like some of you. And I know this will weird some of you out. And again, will probably disappoint some of you. But Tassie, she slept on my pillow at night. If you ever wondered why I had dog breath, that's the reason. But one day I got a call from Faith and she said, Joe, please come home. I think Tassie is dying. And by the time I got home, she was gone. And as I've done many times, I dug that little shallow grave in our backyard. And in fact, we have so many pets buried in our backyard. I'm afraid that someone will come in and discover all the bones. They'll rope off our yard thinking it's an active crime scene. But, but as I laid her remains to rest, I had to, 
yeah, your pastor had to fight back the tears. So I tell you to let you know that I'm, I'm not this insensitive monster that hates animals, much to the contrary. I, uh, I love animals. But, but in diving into this question, let's just for fun here take a vote. By the way, our, our topic will get much more serious in a couple of minutes, so enjoy the levity while it lasts. But those of you who think that Tassie or Herman or your Fluffy is going to go to heaven when he or she dies, raise your hand. Anybody think that? Okay, there, there are a few that, that, um, that do. Well, before we get into a, a biblical discussion, let me give you some logic. For those of you that think pets do go to heaven, let me just ask you, if there is a heaven for pets, then is there also a hell for pets? And, and how do pets make the cut? You know, if your dog has too many accidents on the carpet, is that what causes him or her to go to hell? Or if your pet bites five people in their lifetime or a, bites a preacher, <laughs> is that the deciding factor? Or, or would you say it's the pets of godly Christian people that get to go to heaven? You know, they just kind of inherit your faith, but if the owners are not Christians, then they go straight to hell? Or would you say it's the classifications of animals? You know, uh, pets get to go to heaven like dogs and cats and birds and bunny rabbits, but the bearded dragon and the rhinoceros beetle don't because they look too much like the devil. <laughs> you can kind of see where I'm going with this. Well, laying all jokes aside, I think that most of us know logically that our pets will probably not go to heaven nor, nor hell with us. The reason we know that is because when God created man, he created him in his own image, and, and God breathed spiritual life into man. Now, now, God created animals, but not in his own image, and nowhere do we see that God breathed spiritual life into animals. We also know what Romans says in Romans 10, 13, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And as far as I can tell, even Tassie, who was so smart, never called on the name of the Lord. Now, before you shoot me for saying that Fluffy may not go to heaven with you, let me just say it appears that there will be animals in the millennium and, and even in the new heavens and the new earth. We read in Isaiah eleven six: the wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion, the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. Lead a lion. That the cow will feed with the bear, their young will lie down together, the lion will eat straw like an ox, the infant will play near the hole of a cobra, and the young child will put his hand into the viper's nest. And then Revelation chapter 19 shows us that Jesus will ride in on a white horse, implying that in some fashion there will be animals after we die. But sorry to disappoint you, as far as I can tell, it probably will not be Tassie nor Herman, nor your Fluffy. And that was really hard for me to say because my wife said that if I took that stance, she would leave the church. <laughs> I hope she was only joking. Let's deal with another question that takes us a bit deeper. Is it okay to try to contact the dead? And this question really impacts a lot of other kind of sub-questions such as, is it okay to go to palm readers or crystal ball readers? Or is it okay to pay $4.99 a minute to Madam Weirdo so she can tell you where you lost your car keys? Is this okay? Is this all innocent? What does Scripture say about this? Well, I believe that Deuteronomy chapter 18 answers that very clearly. Verse 10 says, And do not let your people, so do not let your people practice fortune-telling, or sorcery, or allow them to interpret omens, or engage in witchcraft, or cast spells, or function as mediums, or psychics, or call forth the spirits of the dead. Anyone who does these things is an object of horror and disgust to the Lord. It's because the other nations have does, done these things that the Lord your God will drive them out ahead of you. You must be blameless before the Lord your God. The people you're about to displace consult with sorcerers and fortune tellers, but the Lord your God forbids you to do such things. So psychics, interpreting omens, crystal ball readers, even reading your horoscope, these things, in my opinion, they're not cute, they're not innocent. 
I believe they can even be dangerous because they can serve as gateway activities to things that involve the dark underworld. You say, well, well, Joe, what about going to one of those so-called prophets that make their way around to different churches? And you hear about that on occasion. They've come to our community and they will urge people to come and they will prophesy over them and sometimes tell them what they've done in the past and what will happen to them in the future. And, 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 and I know that some may disagree with me here, but I still urge caution. I, I know there is the true and the biblical gift of prophecy. We can't deny that. But, but most of the time, prophets in the Bible, if you read the Bible, if you study the Bible, prophets were people who spoke for God. They gave God's word. They gave God's message. And obviously, I don't have an issue with that. In fact, we probably need more true prophets today. People who are willing to stand up boldly speak for God and be his mouthpiece and his messenger. That is a gift in the Bible. We don't want to deny the gift of prophecy. But I'm generally uncomfortable with those who call themselves prophets. If, if their main goal is to try to look into your past and tell you, well, you know, I see this in your past and there was abuse and all that kind of stuff that they say, or I'm looking into your future and, you know, some good things are going to come. And if you're trying to sell your house, you know, it's, it's, it's going to sell and you're, you're going to meet this young man if you're not married and he's going to sweep you off your feet and you're going to just ride into the sunset and be happily married forever and, you know, good things are going to happen to you. I, I'm not saying that all of this is hocus pocus, but, but the Bible urges caution about swallowing everything that even good and godly people will tell you. You know, 1 John 4, 1 says, dear friends, do not believe every spirit. But test the spirits to see whether they're from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And, and I am a firm believer that, that God gives us guidance. God gives us direction. And, and I'm a firm believer that at times he can use other people to do that. When, when we took this church, my dear friend back there on that back row, he's a back row beauty, Van Baker, um, he gave us some counsel that I believe was from the Lord. I believe that God uses other people to help us at times find his will. But just because someone says, I have a message from the Lord for you, doesn't always mean that it's from the Lord. It could be, but it might not be. Test the spirits is what scripture says. It may be from the Lord, or it may be a message from a well-meaning person that just wants to encourage you and is saying, the Lord told me to tell you this, or perhaps on occasion, it could be someone trying to manipulate you. Another scripture that deals with this is in um, 1 John, uh, I'm sorry, in, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 19, it says, do not put out the Spirit's fire. So don't be one of those that tries to pour cold water on the moving of the Spirit. You know, if the Spirit is obviously moving, don't throw cold water on it. Verse 20 says, do not treat prophecies with contempt. So don't look down on those, nor look down on the messages that true prophets are bringing from the Word of God. Verse 21, test everything. In other words, don't be gullible. Don't swallow hook, line, and sinker what some perhaps well-meaning and even godly person is telling you. The Bible says, test it. How do you test it? Search the Scriptures. See if it lines up to biblical principles. Seek advice from other godly people. And then it goes on and says, hold on to the good. And of course, the implication, let go of the bad. If it's bad advice, let it go. Don't swallow it. If it's good, hold on to it. Verse 22, avoid every kind of evil. So prophecies can be good, but never put more trust in a person than you put trust in the Word of God. This always is right. A person might be right, might be wrong. This is never wrong. And please don't get involved in anything that might seem harmless and innocent, but could perhaps be a gateway activity to the underworld. Let's deal with another question, and, and this is a very heavy subject that we will approach with a lot of carefulness and sensitivity, but... I had someone ask me this question this past week, and I had people ask me this question from time to time. Can a person who commits suicide go to heaven? 
And again, we're going to be very gentle here because for some of you, and I know some of you here, this hits really close to home and it's still a very open and fresh wound. So let's talk about this. First of all, in our country, one study said that around 1 million people attempt suicide a year. The number is twice what it was a decade ago. So that just tells you how many people are hurting. About 1 in 15 who attempt suicide actually succeed. And of course, 1 is way too many. And as a pastor, I've done way too many funerals for people who in a moment of desperation did something that not only changed their lives forever, but changed the lives of their family. I've had the services and stood by families of suicide victims of men and women, old and young. One was 14 years old. It's never easy for me. And the anguish for families is unparalleled. And many times this repeats itself in future generations. In fact, I had, I've had the responsibility of preaching the funerals for those who took their lives, and they were three different generations in the same family. This brings so much anguish in families, and, and they deal with the trauma years down the road. And, and just talking about this brings up all kinds of emotions within me as it does in some of you. And I just want to say before we get into this, if any of you are dealing with thoughts of self-harm, I beg of you, I plead with you to talk to someone today. Let someone walk the journey with you. I, I promise, even though you may not feel loved because of the depth of your emotional anguish sometimes, it's just so confusing, but there are people who care for you. There are people who love you. There are people that would do anything for you, but they need to know where you are. Let someone be there for you. Self-harm is never, ever, ever the answer. Besides that, they've done studies that say over 90% of the people who attempted suicide but did not succeed, they lived through it, they said if they would have just waited 24 hours longer, they would have not attempted it. But as we look at this increasing dilemma in our society, if we go to the Bible, we see there are at least seven examples and probably more of people who took their own life in Scripture. Just to mention three of them, Saul in the Old Testament, when he was wounded, he was wounded in battle. He didn't want the enemy to capture him. And so the Bible says he fell on his own sword and took his life. That was King Saul. Judas, in the New Testament, after he betrayed Jesus, he couldn't live with himself. And so the Bible says he went out and took his own life. In the Old Testament, Samson, if you remember, once he regained his strength from God, he he. he pushed the columns holding up the walls, knowing that, yes, it would take out a lot of his enemies. In fact, the Bible said he took out more of his enemies in the time of his death than in the time of his life, but he also knew that that would take his life as well. So, so back to our question, and again, walking very gently here, can someone who takes their own life spend eternity in heaven? Well, try to hear me out as I've as I've studied the Bible, I haven't been able to find a verse that says, if you take your own life, then you'll go to hell. In fact, in the Bible, it mentions that in certain situations, laying down or taking your life makes you a hero. Jesus said in John 15, 13, greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life or take his life for his friends. And this could be illustrated during times of war. Someone throws out a grenade, a soldier sees it, jumps on it, covers it up, takes his own life, but in so doing, saves the life of his buddies. I think all of us would say that even though this person took his or her own life, we would call them a hero. Or we've heard the stories of heroes during some of the school shootings. Ann Murphy, age 52, at Sandy Hook a few years ago, a wife and a mother of four, when the gunman came into her classroom, she put herself in front of the students, and the gunman took her down, and her body was found covering children, trying to protect them from the gunman. We applaud her. Victoria Soto, age 27, also at Sandy Hook, when she heard the shot, she, she hid the kids in a closet, and as the gunman came into her room, she jumped in front of him trying to distract him, and in so doing took multiple bullets and lost her life trying to protect her children. We call these people brave and heroic. So what are a few principles that apply? Well, first of all, we know that murder is wrong. Murder is a sin. 
And I pray that God will just help us here. I know there are some people that are listening and looking for a ray of hope for a relative of theirs that took their life. But we know that murder is sin. We know that taking your own life is a type of murder. So I would say that unquestionably suicide is very, very wrong. It's God's responsibility to give life and take life. And anytime we try to play God and take a life, whether it's taking the life, listen, taking the life of a baby in a womb or taking the life of an elderly citizen that may have Alzheimer's, has no awareness or quality of life, or, or taking your own life because you feel hopeless and that life is no longer worth living. Taking the life of anyone is wrong. I don't ever want to open the door for what has been called mercy killing. Again, whether it's a child in the womb, or a parent that won't be able to provide a good life for the child, or in the womb of a parent that won't be able to provide a good life for a child, or, or a person in a nursing home that has lost all quality of life, regardless of circumstances, even though in our minds, sometimes it sounds like it's humane and logical, we can't take on the role of God and take life. That's not up to us. And when it comes to suicide, I know the traditional position of churches around the world in the past has been pretty much unbending. They've they believe that taught that suicide automatically destines you for hell. And I know that in some cases that is certainly realistic. If you look at the lives of those who have taken their lives, many of them were not living for God. Their, their lives were in direct conflict to God's will for them. And so I, I can't just easily preach all suicide victims into heaven and say they're in a better place, no longer suffering anymore. I can't do that. But on the other hand, would you please hear me? Over the years, I've developed a greater sensitivity, and you can call me a compromiser if you want, but I've developed a greater sensitivity and, and have greater compassion for those who take their lives. And because of that, neither can I just automatically preach them into hell. I believe that in some cases, people just snap. What they do is not premeditated. They snap because of emotional trauma or because of intense physical pain. Sometimes I believe that they're trying to get someone's attention. It's their plea for help, and they end up going too far. And then, sometimes when someone takes their life, death is not instantaneous, and so they may have a few seconds or minutes to repent. And so... Who am I to decide who goes to heaven and who goes to hell? Besides that, one of the men in the Bible who took his own life, Samson, this is so strange, but God ended up putting him in Hebrews 11, the hall of faith, as one of the great heroes of the faith. He took his life. God put him in the hall of faith. And again, I don't understand that. I'm just grateful that God is merciful God is just, he's fair, he's loving, he's not willing that we perish, he gives us every opportunity to know him. And again, if anyone is having thoughts of self-harm, please, please seek out a friend and let them walk with you during this time. Let's deal with another question, and this one's a little bit lighter in nature. Can those who are in heaven see what is happening on earth today? You know, we've all heard people say, well, my grandma passed away, and I know she's looking down on me, watching over me, and she's with me every day, and they find great comfort in that. And, and if you do, that's good. But for me, there are certain things I do that I don't want my grandma seeing. <laughs> and those of you, those who believe that grandma is watching you today, they often point to Hebrews chapter 12, where it says, therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, you know, they say witnesses means they're witnessing what's going on on earth. But as I look at that scripture, study that scripture, I see them as witnesses, not to what's happening so much on earth, as to witnesses to the faithfulness and to the goodness and to the glory of God. And the story that, that Jesus told in Luke chapter 16 about Lazarus and the rich man, the, the rich man was in Hades or, or in hell, and, and uh, Lazarus was in heaven. And we read that although the rich man could remember he had five brothers still on earth with, without Christ, yet it doesn't appear that neither he nor Lazarus could see what was going on on earth. In fact, if you could see what was happening on earth from heaven, 
for many, it would cause excruciating pain. So my biblical guess, and this is one of those situations where it's probably more of an opinion than something that I can back by Scripture, I don't believe that those in heaven can see everything that's going on on earth. And if that shakes your faith, I'm sorry. And since that's an opinion answer, you can disagree and have your own theory. Number five, how does God determine the timing for taking his children to heaven? Is it random? Does God one day say, okay, let's see. I think I'm going to take Joe today. I need a trumpet player for one, the 100th chair in the heavenly orchestra. He's not great, so he can fit in 100 maybe. Uh, or, or you know what, I, I think I'll take Gene today. Is that how God determines? Is it randomly? You know, we, we hear people say, well, God wanted another rose in his garden, so he chose my loved one. Or, or he wanted another soprano or, or, or bass in his choir, and so he took my loved one home. I've probably said that. But is that the way that God operates? Well, when you think about it, that whole concept really doesn't make sense. To think that God is so selfish that he would allow the pain of death in a family just to satisfy his desires to have another choir member or another rose in his garden, that doesn't line up to the character of a loving God. God's not selfish. God doesn't work that way. God says there's a time to be born. There's a time to die. And with our limited understanding, we probably won't be able to fully understand how God decides when it's time for us to take our last breath. But I don't believe it's to selfishly satisfy his need for another rose in his garden or another voice in his choir. God has a predetermined time for us to die. And from our perspective, it may not seem like the right time, but it's not random. It's not by accident. Again, there's a time to be born, a time to die. Number six, is it possible that death could just be a state where we cease to exist? And the reason I, I bring this up is because there are those even in our community who would say, well, when you die, it's just annihilation. You know, you just go into a state of nothingness. You just cease to exist. But when God created us, he created us with a never dying soul. In the Bible, with regards to our soul, we read words like eternal, everlasting, forever, will never end, which clearly indicates that once we are conceived and become a human being in our mother's womb, from that point forward, we will always exist. Now, 70, 80, 90 years of that existence will be on planet Earth, but the rest of that never-ending existence will be in the hereafter, even in heaven, either, either in heaven or in hell. Charles Wesley, the, the brother of, of John Wesley, whom we consider to be the father of Wesleyanism and kind of a father of our church, he wrote a hymn entitled, um, A Charge to Keep I Have. Anybody remember that? Just a charge to keep I have. And it's a great hymn, just as, you know, Rachel brought back a, a great hymn that's been comfort to us. Um, but what Charles Wesley wrote in that first verse encapsulates what Scripture says on this. He writes, a charge to keep I have, a God to glorify, here it is, a never-dying soul to save and fit it for the sky. So if we study the Bible, we see that death is not a state where we will just cease to exist. Death is the event that takes us into our permanent existence in eternity, again, either heaven or hell, but we will always exist. With that in mind, let's wrestle with the last and the most important question of all. Some people want to know, and this is so important, is heaven our default destination? And we dealt a little bit with this several weeks ago, but I feel we need to kind of wrap this series up and emphasize this again it's a sobering question. Is heaven our default destination? And if you listen to what we all say when, you know, when our friends and our loved ones die, it almost comes across that heaven is where everybody goes, except for maybe that, that uh, exceptionally bad sinner, you know, the serial killer, the child abuser, the murderer, the drug dealer, they probably will go to hell. But everybody else, at least in our community, 
pretty much when they die, they go to heaven. Is that what the Bible teaches? Well, not really. Not even close. The, the Bible teaches that we are to, in, in, in Matthew 7, says, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads where to destruction, and many, many enter through it. So the Bible says that many will go to hell. How about heaven? Verse 14, but small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life. And listen to this word, and only a few will find it. Did you catch that? A few. Now, thankfully, God so loved the world that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. But just because we are good, conservative, flag-waving, pledge-saying, patriotic people that have been baptized doesn't mean that we will automatically go to heaven. And many people today are living with what you might call a postmodern view of spirituality. People see God as, as a journey rather than a, a savior. You know, just go on a journey to be good, do good, try to be a good neighbor. But what does Scripture say? John 14, 6, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, through Jesus. Acts 4.12 says, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. So, did, did you catch that? We must be saved. The, the journey, the God journey, must include an experience of salvation. We must be be saved. And then after we've been saved, we must obey. In Matthew 7, 21, it says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Can I just put a different spin on that? Lord, Lord, maybe would be, well, I'm conservative. You know, I pray to God. I'm a good person. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So heaven is not our default destination, but we all have the opportunity to choose Jesus and be saved. And then when we're saved, we must obey his will. We can't go off and do our own thing. We must be saved and obey. So it's time to wrap up our series, and let me just remind you of a few things that we've talked about over the last month and a half. Number one, how you live your life this side of the grave determines what, where you will live your life on the other side of the grave. So be wise in your choices today. How you live today determines tomorrow. Number two, know that today and tomorrow and every day Satan is looking for a way to sneak into your life and get you. His goal is your eternal destruction, and, <clears throat> and he's good at what he does. Don't be overconfident. Don't be prideful. On this earth, you are never above falling. By God's grace, we don't have to fall. But if we're not careful, we can fall. Number three, remember that 777 has conquered 666. In other words, God has overcome Satan. And we can be victorious through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Number four, the key to right living is abiding in Christ. As long as we abide in Christ, we're in good hands. But the moment we leave his care, we're in deep trouble. So, do you know Jesus? Are you obeying Jesus? Are you living a life that pleases Jesus? Is there any unconfessed sin in your life? And this morning, before we go, I, I want to pray. And I pray that God will just begin searching our hearts right now. If there is any area of disobedience, 
any sin, unconfessed sin in our life, I pray that this morning we would take care of that with God and we would just come to him and say, Jesus, would you forgive me? Would you cleanse me? Help me to obey you. Could we just all do that right now? Just all come to him, bow your heads. Oh Lord, I pray that right now there would be just the honesty of heart. Father, I pray that there would be no one here that would be lost. And God, I pray that we would all be saved and not just have the experience of salvation, but then we would obey step by step. God, we want to live our lives right because what we do on this side of the grave determines what happens on the other side. So Lord, for those that are here this morning, I pray that you would bring forgiveness. Would you bring cleansing? And God, we know that few will be that find it, but we can all find it. We know that the Bible says many will be destroyed. Few will go, but God, what's so wonderful is that we can all go. You've made provision. Every one of us can go to heaven. And I pray, Father, that right now we would just let the Holy Spirit come and, and cleanse us. Lord, that we would be saved and that we would obey. Father, I pray for those that are hurting from some of the discussion that we had earlier. Lord, those that are worried about relatives. Lord, those that have lost relatives and the pain is there, give them comfort, give them peace, give them hope. And God, for those that are just maybe hopeless right now and are considering hurting themselves, I pray that, God, they would seek out a friend. And Lord, that they would be healed and realize that through Jesus Christ, we can conquer everything. Even when we don't see any light at the end of the tunnel, through Jesus Christ, there is hope. So, Father, um, thank you for your help during the last month and a half. God, let us be ready for that time when we fall asleep. Lord, that we would make sure that we're serving Jesus. Thank you for my friends here that have come, my friends that are listening on the radio, my friends that are watching the live stream. God, go with us, I pray, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. And ladies and gentlemen, now you can fall asleep.